Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. This is one I've been wanting to do since we started the show. Today we have John Ingalls and Richard Sever from BioArchive MedArchive talking about the history and setup of the servers. The way we usually do this when we've got two guests is that we get you to introduce yourselves so that people know what your voice sounds like. Um, although I guess most people listening to this probably already know what you both sound like because you're probably the most well-known people we'll have on here. That's true, Johnny. You better up your game. <laughs> So, John, you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, sure. Well, uh, my name is John Ingalls. I am the executive director and publisher of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press and a co-founder of BioArchive and Medoc. And Richard? Um, I'm Richard Sever. I am the assistant director um, and I am the other co-founder of BioArchive and one of several co-founders of MedArchive. And you didn't just jump into life founding a preprint server. I assume you did things before 2013. So could you give us a little bit of background as to where you were both coming from? Um, well, since I'm the, the older of the two, let me start. <laughs> it's a much longer story. Um, so I grew up in Scotland. Um, I did a PhD at Edinburgh Medical School in Immunology. Then I was lucky enough to be uh, appointed assistant editor of The Lancet. And then I got the chance to start uh, a journal called Immunology Today, which is a monthly review journal now known as Trends in Immunology. And in 1987, Jim Watson called me up and invited me to come to Cold Spring Harbor for a couple of years uh, with the idea that we might uh, turn what was then a small publications department with a six month old journal into a sort of university press. And so what we have now is a, a publishing house that is a division of the laboratory that contributes to the laboratory in many different ways that consists of nine journals and roughly 200, 250 books in print and in electronic form. And then the preprint servers came along while well, BioArchive started in 2013 and MedArchive started in uh, 2019. So that's the sort of portfolio of things that are going on. Here. I am. Um, I love Edinburgh as a city. My next move, I really want to be Edinburgh. I'd love to live there for a oh, bit. Still my favourite place in the world, John. Really. It's a, it's a beautiful city. And the people there are really nice too. I think you and Marlena Dietrich, didn't she say that Edinburgh? It was the most wonderful place in the world. It is. If you could, you know, replace the weather, it would be anyway. Even for someone as old as I am, Richard, she's a little before my time. <laughs> uh, and Richard? Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm Richard Sever, and um, I'm going second because I am much younger than John. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, I, um, I in some ways, as, as a bit of a similar path, I did a undergrad in biochemistry at Oxford um, and then made the radical change to move to Cambridge um, to the MRC to do my PhD at the, um, the LMB Molecular Biology. Um, and then I, too, um, moved into, into the editorial work. I was a, an editor of Current Opinion and Cell Biology, Trends in Biochemical Sciences, and then for a while um, worked um, at Company of Biologists, who you know, as uh, executive editor of Journal of Cell Science. And then I came to, uh, at John's invitation, well, at John's second invitation, maybe yes. we can get into that, um, <laughs> uh, in, to, in 2008 to Cold Spring Harbor to, um, to do new things and so some of those involved books, some of them involved review journals like Cold Spring Harbor Perspectives, and of course, um, uh, BioArchive and, and MedArchive being the most recent new things. So that you're kind of jumping into my next question there then, which is how come you, you both met? But I guess that's John trying to poach you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking about um, that the other day, Johnny, the, you know, the, the move to online publishing in scholarly publishing made a tremendous difference. It you know, publishing, scholarly publishing was pretty siloed up to that point. But one of the things that happened when we all started putting stuff online was that 
organizations like the National Academy here started having meetings to sort of discuss this new landscape of online information distribution. And so we started meeting people in that context that we hadn't met before. And so Richard at that time was still at Company of Biologists in Cambridge and uh, would come over for, uh, for the National Academy meetings. But also we, both his journals and ours, were hosted by Highwire Press, which had um, community-based uh, meetings and that introduced us all to, you know, a much wider circle of people than we had known before. And and in my case, that was uh, that included Richard. So as he said, he he gracefully declined my first invitation. But I I am known to be persistent. So I um, we circled back and. This time, I don't think, I think there were other attractions to coming to America, but maybe he doesn't particularly want to get into that. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of the National Academy meetings, but yeah, there was those. I mean, the, 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 the meeting I remember seeing John out most of it, and actually this is one of those things where, you know, we talk about, you know, the situation with the pandemic and so much going on remotely. And it actually, it feels like this was an, uh, an example of one of those instances where, there was a kind of, you know, environment that it's very hard to recapitulate in the online world in that, you know, so we would go to these meetings, but the one I remember in particular, because I went, I went every year for many years was the American Society for Cell Biology meeting. And, and, you know, and I would always see John and he would be somebody I would see at, you know, that scientific meeting, as well as these sort of more editorial publishing type meetings. And I think, I can't remember um, exactly when, but I do remember at one fairly early on, speaking with John there and we'd met a couple of times and he asked me if I was interested in coming to Cold Spring Harbor and I said no <laughs> but I mean the, the reason for that was not that not because the idea didn't appeal but um, we were doing a lot of things at company biologists and I and I felt that you know not so necessarily duty bound but I wanted to finish what was was being done then and then I think he was he was he tried again shall we say and um, and then and that 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 sort of invitation came um you know, I don't know, four or five years later at a time, which really seemed to make an awful lot of sense because I felt like, you know, anything I was doing afterwards at Journal of Cell Science in many respects was, you get, I mean, the old saying is you get to a point where, you know, you can do the job standing on your head. Mm -hmm. And it felt a bit like like that. And it had been that I had such a good time. I didn't want to get to the point where I it began to feel stale. So, and and the other thing that was also very appealing was, was that, you know, it wasn't like John was interested in hiring me to do a specific thing. It was all very vague, which really did sound nice, like, you know, come along and we can do things and we can decide what those things will be. And that's, I mean, I think that's crucial, Richard, and I'm glad you raised that because, you know, one of the great assets that one of the great benefits of doing what we do is that we're doing it in this institution, which is interested in, I mean, broadly speaking, the reason there is a press or a publishing house at Cold Spring Harbor is because our job is to do things that are useful to science and scientists. So, and we've done all kinds of different things that we rationalize on the basis of, oh, you know, scientists would find this helpful or useful or entertaining or educational. And we've done a lot of different things. The, the institution is interested in novelty, willing to put resources behind new things that uh, we can justify. And uh, we've been very fortunate to have that support from every level of the institution, you know, through the scientific staff up to the administration and to the level of the, the board of trustees. So it's been it's been a great experience. And I mean, I have never, I have no intention of staying in this country for as long as I can, but it's just been continually interesting. <laughs> I know, but that's such an important point about being embedded in the lab, you know, is, is, is uh, and it's hard. I mean, there are other, there are universities and there are research institutes that have some form of publishing enterprise. But I think, you know, I, I really don't think that there's anything like Cold Spring Harbor in that respect. You know, I mean, John supervises students here. I lecture students on on various things and it's really integrated in a in an incredible way and you know sometimes I think it's really important for the kinds of things that we do having that experience being right next to you know having sort of faculty 20 yards away that type of thing uh, you know I sometimes feel like you know people often have discussions about you know particularly in publishing meetings people have discussions about authors and author behavior and blah 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 and I sometimes you know they say things that don't kind of like 
I, I don't quite buy. And occasionally I feel like, you know, sort of Woody Allen in Annie Hall with where I can sort of grab um, Marshall McLuhan and say, well, actually, I have him right here. And I feel like that's like I actually have a scientist right next to me who I can talk to and ask them about this sort of thing. So I think I mean, that's been immensely beneficial. Yeah. You know, the other thing that we have sort of thousands of um, scientists coming through Cold Spring Harbor every year who aren't Cold Spring Harbor scientists because we have this meetings program. So it's, it's I mean, that's been going on for decades. So it's, it's, you know, I mean, and I think, you know, as we get to on to talking about things like bioarchive and med archive, that's what I've always thought was the natural extension of lab activity and why Cold Spring Harbor was absolutely the right place to kind of like, you know, create bioarchive because it just, it fitted with this unusual place, which had a stellar research program and this kind of like more than a hundred year old science communication program. Yeah, the, the meetings coming off through science, it was the Cold Spring Harbour meetings and the uh, Gordon Keystone meetings that were up to that I was told you always must go to. I've been to neither yet. So far, my scientific career has me to London a few times <laughs> and virtually to Scotland. Uh, oh, and Warwick. Let's not forget Warwick. So, so far, I've not been out of the UK scientifically, which sucks. If anyone's listening and wants to get me out there, fly me out. But yeah, and, and, and then the other side of that was the, the Cold Spring Harbour protocols which I still use to this day. That was the first thing I think I ever knew about Cold Spring Harbor is they have these amazing set protocols, which are all online and free. No, I mean, that, I think that, that was such an important point. And, you know, there's no more chastening gut check than having a, what you consider to be a great idea, which you mentioned to a bunch of scientists in the bar on a Friday night, and they look at you with that sort of seriously <laughs> kind of look, and you realize, Okay, maybe not such a good idea after all. So, I mean, we're, and and this is not to brag about it, we're just very fortunate to have a sort of in-house, large and rambunctious focus group <laughs> on a permanent basis if we if we choose to, you know, to, to use them that way. And, uh, and the faculty are generally very generous about sharing their opinions and their expertise and, and their practical help too at times. Are they, all, are they all supportive or do you have a nice group who will counter that as well? Well, that's a great, that is a great question. And um, Richard, do you, I don't know, do you want, I'm talking too much. You, you, you no, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I think there's two anecdotes that are really relevant here. I'll, since I'm so often the bad guy and John is the good guy, <laughs> I'll let John be the bad guy and tell the nasty one first. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the proposal or bioarchive was remarkably short document that was sent to uh, Bruce Stillman, who is a, a very significant scientist in the field of uh, DNA replication and has been the president here for a long time. And, you know, Bruce is, he has his uh, beliefs in how science can, should work and how things should be done right. And I thought, you know, this is going to be challenging this discussion that I'm going to have with him. But in fact, it was there was almost no discussion about it at all because he basically handed me back the proposal that Richard and I had spent ages drafting and said, this is great, we should do this. Now let's talk about the symposium, you know, that was the meeting that was about to come up. And so Bruce was, you know, just on board from the beginning, but he and I both discovered that there were senior faculty members around here who thought this was a terrible idea and said so publicly. And, and Bruce, bless him, stood up equally publicly and said, you're wrong. This is something that is important and we're going to do. So it was not universally accepted. And in fact, I think what we found in the early days of bioarchive, that there was a, a division very much along generational lines, that the younger faculty, the young postdocs and so on, they thought it was a terrific idea because they had grown up as digital, digital natives sharing everything about their lives. And why shouldn't you share science in exactly the same way? But for the more established PIs, I guess, feeling that they had turf to protect, the idea of, you know, giving away footprints, that, that took a lot of getting their mind. You know, and, and another aspect, I mean, I recall very vividly, which again speaks to the advantage of being in, embedded and having people that you can talk to who are, are, are real scientists, um, was, you know, there'd been this kind of like narrative for, for years that, that, that archive, oh, 
physics is different. Physics and maths are different. It won't work in biology. It's fundamentally different. These are different people. The culture is different, et cetera, et cetera. And then we were lucky enough to have people like Mickey Atwell and Justin Kinney here at Cold Spring Harbor. And, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to, to those people. And, and I, I brought this up. I, do you, you know, I said, people say this. And their response was absolute nonsense. You know, they had been physicists, they had been mathematicians, and now they were biologists. And they, they just said, it's exactly the same. The people are exactly the same. They were just, the only thing that, that, the only thing that they found astounding was that they said when they became biologists, I think it was Mickey who said that. I mean, he was just, you know, yeah. he was shocked that there wasn't something like this already. <laughs> but, you know, one of the strands towards bioarchive, um, Johnny Starks, uh, it, it actually got, can be traced back to 1998, when one of the meetings that we had as one in our small conference center, the Banbury Center, was about the genome and, and, the, and all aspects of, of what was the emergent you know, genome science. And there was a session in that meeting that Paul Ginsberg, the founder of Archive, was invited to. So this was seven years after Archive had got going. Now, the other participants in that session were Mike Eisen, yet to found PLOS, the, me the meeting itself was organized by Pat Brown, yet to found PLOS. David Lipman, who was a big advocate for you know, open access, he spoke in that session as well. And it was Michael Ashburn, who was a Drosophila geneticist who was very much involved in, in you know, uh, pushing the idea that genome data should be open, freely accessible, and, and shared. So there was, you know, the organizers of that meeting, even in 1998, genome scientists saw this idea of sharing was in the air. And that, as you know, infused the, how the whole human genome project evolved with the open sharing of meetings, of, of um, so open sharing of data and techniques. And we had, a, we had and still have an annual genome meeting at Cold Spring Harbor where a lot of that sharing took place. So I, I talked to Paul at that meeting in 1998, and I didn't really know much about archive at that point, but I remember thinking this would be a fantastic idea, but I just don't think the community at large is ready for it. And I, and I remained firm in that belief. And as you know, from those years onwards, there were a number of efforts to start preprint servers in biology and medicine, which didn't take off for a variety of reasons. But I think one of the reasons was that the community was just not ready at that point. Timing counts for everything. Yeah. I mean, that, that feeds into my next question, which is sort of what expectations did you have when you set this up? Did you think it would be what it is now? Or did you think it might last a few years and then it might fizzle out like the other ones had? Um, I, I, I think it was just, it was really difficult to know, but I, I, I do think, you know, as John says, there was a, we did have a sense that the timing might be, be right, because I mean, as it's, you know, I mean, as I said to, when, when people have asked me in the past about, you know, that, you know, the birth of bioarchive and the idea of a bioarchive, I was always very keen to point out that this is an incredibly unoriginal idea. It was an idea that many people had had many, many times. And so that, you know, there wasn't a, a eureka moment. And, you know, and, and, I, and it, as, as John said, this had been percolating for a bit, and I, you know, and I mean, I, I remember a conversation with John when we talked about this. And, you know, I mean, I think if I remember, I, John, even you were a little bit skeptical because you were like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've heard this idea many, many times. What's different now? And, and, and for me, I think the thing that really made me think that the time was not nigh was seeing the population genetics community who even in the absence of a bioarchive were trying to move in that direction. And there was a site called Haldane Civ that Graham Coop and Joe Pickrell had set up to kind of point to this handful of um, sort of population genetics preprints that were on archive. And so then we started talking to a lot of people around and, you know, John mentioned the biology of genomes meeting. And we had, those, we had this incredible sort of lunchtime set, which I remember very vividly because we got Joe and we got Yaniv Ehrlich, who was a former uh, PhD student here who was, who was keen, Leonid Krugliak, who went on to become on the Bioarchive Advisory Board and several others. And, and, and it was kind of, it, it was weird because it all seemed a bit cloak and dagger in a way. It was the idea of getting these people in one room and saying, look, we think we should do this. What do you think? And to which the answer was, yes, absolutely, you should do it. 
And, you know, John, I, I seem to remember there was some reporter from science who got wind of this and was trying to get into the lunchtime room. And we were like, look, this, this, is, this is not an open meeting. <laughs> but there was this sense that um, it, a kind of like, if not now, when? And, and, and certainly, um, John, I mean, you know, I don't know what your feelings were at the time. We did talk about this a bit, but I, I certainly felt that this was now inevitable, that someone was going to do it and that absolutely it should be done by us because we, I think that's the point where we were sort of arrogant enough to say Cold Spring Harbor, because of all these other reasons, because of the biology of genomes, because of the connection with genetics, and, you know, just knowing about how the publishing ecosystem works, because we knew, frankly, that there were going to be challenges there, because there might have been a handful of Cold Spring Harbor faculty who weren't keen on the idea, but there was a lot of people in the publishing community who were really not keen on the idea. So, you know, I mean, I think it was that kind of that feeling that the time was right, and particularly the place was right. But I yeah. don't think we... We, I don't think we were, we certainly weren't confident enough to say, you know, this is a done deal, this is going to work. I mean, not, not that we entered it thinking that failure was really an option. I mean, I, I think my feeling at the time was, um, well, first of all, one thing we should say is that we had had, before we made the decision to launch, we had had a serious conversation with Paul Ginsberg about whether Archive was going to expand to sort of fill the space that we envisage bioarchive um, filling. And um, he said, no, that was not, it was not an option for them from, from a variety of perspectives. So that was encouraging. I think I felt that if at, at the very worst, this would be useful for the genome community and, and maybe associate, you know, computational biology um, and so on, just, you know, a little sort of perhaps it would be small. Uh, smaller in scope than we than we originally imagined, but you know we didn't know. But we set it up with these um, twenty six subject categories and sort of waited to see how quickly they'd be populated. And 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 the first subject category out of the box was not one that I had predicted. It turned out to be evolutionary biology, which in retrospect one can t- perfectly easily understand, but wasn't a predicted event. So, so a lot, of, a lot of the sort of initial take up was in those kind of areas, though it was where you you would kind of expect it to be. It took a little bit longer for some of the rest of us to kind of catch on. Absolutely, but we should be very clear that's not surprising because if you look at archive, it's exactly what happened for archive. And I, you know, I remember um, being up at Cornell with Paul and him showing me the archive growth curve which is really interesting and it's you know there's there's several I think there's some examples of this in in technology where you you have what looks like a growth curve but then when you drill down you see what it is is it's uh, it's the kind of addition of many many different small growth curves and so what this happened what happened in in physics was the um, high energy physicists adopt and then came you know, the astrophysicists, and then came the condensed metaphysicists, etc. And um, we feel like the early days of bioarchive were similar in that respect, and that, you know, the, the early adopters were these people in evolutionary biology and genomics, but very quickly, but a sense that the broader community of genetics was interested, and then, you know, come kind of steaming up behind came the neuroscientists, because a lot of those did computational work. And so you get some of this, um, and then cell and developmental biology, um, and what's kind of interesting, and I've had conversations with people in the cell and developmental biology community, is a sort of time zero for them is kind of like a couple of years later than the time zero for the, they, they literally hadn't heard of it. Mm-hmm. And it was quite, you know, I mean, you, one of the things that was was kind of interesting in, in, in genomics was very quickly, you'd go to meetings like the Society for Human Genetics or Biology of Genomes at Cold Spring Harbor, and you'd find almost every presentation in some sessions had a bioarchive link at the end. And, and now that's not unusual at all. And you can, you know, you can go to an SCB meeting or you can go to a, you know, um, a COVID meeting um, and, and see that. But at the time it was pretty unusual. So it was, it was interesting to see it, it percolate through. And I think the one lesson I've, I've had, and actually this is something that Paul says an awful lot about archive and, and preprints in general, is that no community that has started doing this has stopped. 
And that, I think, you know, it's just a question of when you start and, the, and, and, and maybe the rates are different in different subfields yeah. for different reasons. I mean, even in physics, there is incomplete penetrance of preprints in certain fields. Um, and we, we mustn't lose sight of that. You know, it just takes time. Did you? So one of the stories I've heard about the early phase of archive is that there was a big name jumped on really early on. And when that preprint was posted, suddenly everyone else sort of followed suit. Did, did you have any sort of huge names early on that sort of sped up that process? Or did you just have a lot of different people adopting it? I, I don't think that was, I don't think that was true in, in the beginning. Um, you know, the, the growth curve was fairly smooth and generally speaking upward. What did happen was um, that ASAP Bio organized the meeting and invited a number of Nobel Prize winners and they made public statements in support. People like Carol Greider and, and, and others made public statements in support of preprints, which, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure helped. But we were already on an upward trajectory at, at that point. But, um, I mean, there was, a, an, as a consequence of that meeting, for example, there was a story in the New York Times about it. So, you know, there's a sense then amongst some people that, oh, well, that's when BioArchive got started. But actually, it had been going for at least two years at, uh, up, to that, up to that point. But there's no question that, you know, a community that is influenced by significant figures and if, if certain people um, adopt certain practices, then it, it has an impact. But I think the driver, as I said earlier, the, the real driver behind BioArchive has been young scientists who were often willing to go to their PIs who, who may have been quite reluctant and say, I think it's important that we do this. And we've heard those stories over and over again. That's one of the things we hear a lot. So the people we talk to, we always ask sort of whose decision was it to preprint and why, why they chose to do that. And at almost all, in all cases, if the early career researcher is aware of bioarchive and preprinting, it's their decision. Or it's been a young PI who is obviously it benefits them too. It's, I don't think we've had any examples where it's been a very well-established professor who's kind of made that initial step. And actually, I mean, it's interesting actually now men mentioning that one thing that occurs to me, you know, going back to the kind of right place, right time thing is that the other thing when, when we launched, and as I said, you know, I can't give enough credit to the population geneticists and their incredible role in really getting the momentum going early was that there were a bunch of people, you know, a bunch of people who now, I suspect, nine years later, would, would be seen as pretty well-established investigators. You know, I think of people like, you know, our former colleague, Yanni Verlick. I think of Daniel uh, MacArthur, who was at the Broad and is now back in Australia. And there's a bunch of, of those types of people now. But actually, when we were launched, they were very young, freshly minted PIs. I mean, my first interaction with Daniel, for example, were when he was a postdoc. So I think there was a, a group of these people who, many of whom have gone on to become real superstars in, in, in genomics, who were just at that point, they, was, they had just started their labs and they were looking around and they were saying, this is, um, you know, they, they were like, absolutely the right thing to do. And so I think, you know, that that was, you know, there's a whole constellation of things that, that, that one can talk about that, that, that really helped things along. And I think just the timing of those things, and, and they were critically, they were people, a lot of those people were people who were, who were putting exciting, interesting new work out so that then more senior people would, I mean, I remember going to, um, um, to see Aravind Chakravarti um, at Johns Hopkins. And, you know, I hadn't really talked to him about bioarchive you know i didn't really you know i mean he, he wasn't he wasn't like a, a twitter presence who people were but but you know it was quite clear that through his lab he was learning about important stuff in genomics that was coming out probably because his lab members were on twitter seeing bioarchive papers and so he knew all about it without being ha having to be told so i think that that was kind of interesting yeah we um we talk about twitter a lot on here because I think it's really good for finding papers and and sort of the scientific community. On the on the good side of it, the, the flip side of that, which we've discovered recently, not so unpleasant. But it is, I think, Twitter is amazing for just discoverability and helping along people who might otherwise find it a bit harder to sort of get their work out there. I do think that Twitter has been a contributing force in the uh, growth of, of preprints and bioarchive and archive in particular. I mean, I do see its value 
as a tool in that respect. It just have great regrets about some of the more negative aspects of it. I mean, people within the publishing community have endless discussions about, you know, how people discover information, how they find it, and, you know, and then information deluge. And, you know, as everybody always points out, you, you know, it's almost like every 50 years going back several hundred years, you will find an article by somebody about whatever new technology, be it the printing press or the interweb or the preprint servers have you know, taken us to the point where there's so much of a deluge of information. What are we going to do? And the, the, I mean, this is something that John always points out about, you know, within, um, within academia, the, the importance of kind of trusted sources, you know, within an information deluge, if you are looking for, you know, not the needle in the haystack, but if, if you're looking for information that is relevant and important to you, then in many respects, the best person to tell you is somebody who is kind of like you or maybe a little bit more experienced. And I think that's where the, 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 the Twitter benefit comes in because you think, you know, there are some people who are fairly p- prolific in different areas. And I think of, you know, of the, of the people I follow, you know, I mean, I'm not neuroscience, but there's a handful of people who are really good at surfacing interesting neuroscience that's coming out. Um, and I think with something like BioArchive, you have this giant volume, you know, nobody's going to really look at the table of contents in the way that they would do for a journal. I mean, I guess you could look every morning. That's what happens in physics. I'm not sure whether we've completely recapitulated that behavior in part because biology and medicine together will be a there'll be a much greater volume. But if, you know, if, if, if I know Johnny Coates and I like his opinion and I know he's always up to date on the newest research, then I'll follow him on Twitter knowing that there'll be interesting work coming up. And it's, it's funny, I, I was talking to some people maybe about three years ago, um, a very senior scientist, and I asked her how she discovered new research in her field and she said twitter and i was like seriously and i said you know and she's like i don't even get journals tables of contents anymore i don't bother she said such is my network that in my field i will be able to find it this way which i thought was you know it's the sort of thing that i kind of would have joked about would have not really believed but it, but you know here was this this wasn't somebody who was kind of you know all about the Kardashian index or anything like that. This is somebody who's just saying this is the most efficient way for me to find the most important work in my field. Now, whether whether that individual would say the same thing now, you know, because you know the, the sort of the noise signal has changed a little bit post twenty sixteen and post twenty twenty. But so, at risk of having to ask you to come back, I think we should move on to how the preprint servers work a little bit because I could have a very long discussion about all this for a good few hours. So. Just focus on bioarchive for now. A lot of people are surprised that you actually reject things from the preprint server. Um, that comes up on Twitter pretty much every week. So could you give a little bit of background as to how the server actually functions sort of day to day? Well, we have we have a screening. I mean, we have a submission process, obviously. And then we have a vitally important screening process, which is conducted by an amazing group of young scientists who um, are incredibly dedicated to, to this task. And they go through, they, with, um, with help from a freelance team and also with, with great help from a, a, a very large group of, of uh, working PIs, they basically we, we apply a process um, which is designed to be inclusive, not designed to be exclusive, but some things don't make it. And the kinds of articles that don't make it are, in no particular order, an, an article that is not a research paper. No, so we don't take opinion pieces, we don't take hypotheses unsupported by data, we don't take editorials or letters to the editor or anything of that sort. They are intended to be research papers. We don't take review articles. That's a frequent topic of conversation on Twitter. We don't take stuff that is outside the scientific scope of each of the servers. So it's got to be biology if it's bioarchive. And very occasionally, we don't take articles because for several reasons, we think this particular piece would be better distributed after peer review than before. And we could talk about the criteria that that go into that decision. But that's, broadly speaking, why articles don't make it at, 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 say, BioArchive, but similar criteria at MedArchive, although different. We should talk about the different criteria for MedArchive too. But 
for all the, the sort of grousing that one sees on Twitter about rejection, we are, it's only 8 to 10% of articles that don't get accepted by our archive. And that, that proportion hasn't really changed in years. And there's, there's usually a very specific reason why. Not that the authors always accept that, that their article, you know, isn't a full research paper, but by our criteria, it, that's what we judge it to be. So we'll roughly speak why things don't make it. Did that change with COVID? Because a lot of the, certainly the early COVID research, a lot of it was quite short small pieces like you might have a single table or figure in there so did that change things at all in terms of the, the screening process i don't really think that length has a bearing on this johnny it's it's more about the the nature of the content hmm. but certain certainly it did uh, covid did change things and richard you could speak to that i, I mean my take home lesson from covid actually in many respects was it underscored and you know i mean i'm it, we didn't have the foresight. Um, it, was, it wasn't foresight here, but it did underscore that some of the choices that we've made had been the right ones. So, you know, I am never, I am so grateful that we never wanted any opinion pieces, for example. And, you know, and, and it's interesting, you know, I mean, I, so I had, I had, I've had many conversations with people, you know, that the no review articles um, thing is the thing that pisses people off occasionally. And I try and explain it's, it's not the fact that we don't value you your review or it's just that we need to try to have as much as possible objective inclusion criteria that minimize noise to signal. So if you send me your review article on, I don't know, centrioles, it's very difficult to decline. If I take that, it's very difficult to decline the, 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 the many, many review articles we get at the same time about why vaccines don't work, for example. And the and you know the 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 um the activation energy to open a word file and write something because we're not, remember we're not doing peer review here it is lower and you know we really did see this with COVID we really saw and you know you would be amazed John and my greatest lament about bioarchive and medarchive is that we are not able to publish a book of the crazy shit we've been sent. <laughs> You know, and it is it is a stand. But of course, it, but of course, the the judgment about some of that crazy stuff, you know, is something that begins to look too much like peer review. We can't mm. say we will take we will take review articles if they're from nice people who, you know, who seem to kind of say things we like and not. So, you know, I mean, it's just much easier to say no opinion piece what, what whatsoever. I think the the specific cases, the, you know, so we wrote an article in the BMJ about some of the challenges we've had with COVID-19. One of them was, for example, this whole issue of dual use research of concern, gain of function studies, which, you know, I mean, I, I had been to National Scientific Advisory Board on Biosafety to discuss this with how would Bioarchive bio deal with things like the, you know, the flu papers that came out a few years ago you know, with entering your engineering of viruses. And, you know, it's pretty easy to say, you know, we, we won't post those things. That's, that, that's the kind of guidance given to screeners is flag anything that looks like this. And, you know, one of the criteria you have for things like are pathogens of pandemic potential. That's the kind of gain of function thing that, that people are worried about. And, and, you know, so we continue to have that as a, but on the other hand, if you're in the middle of a pandemic and the, the pathogen you're talking about is already pandemic, it's not, there's no potential there. Mm -hmm. And somebody is doing some, you know, engineering of that to try and understand what's going on with antibody evasion or something like that. You know, is that suddenly PPP or, or, or you already reached that and it can't be any worse. So, you know, that was something that we had to think about and take advice from early on in the pandemic. I think the only change, the only actual specific change, correct me if, if, if you think I'm missing something here, John, but the only specific change I think we made it was for predictions based on in silico research. So yeah. we're very keen. We have a lot of computational biology on bioarchive and, and, and some on medarchive, and we don't discriminate that. But what we'd started to see with COVID-19 very early on was getting an article which was pages and pages of equations, no wet research whatsoever. And then at the end, ergo, and then insert your favorite herbal remedy here as this is going to cure COVID based on that. And so we suddenly realized that actually for the purposes of COVID, 
we, we took the decision to say that we weren't going to take therapeutic predictions that were based entirely on in silico work. And unfortunately, that meant that there were some papers which probably were great because it wasn't some, somebody's favorite herbal remedy that came out of the alleged condition. It was something that probably made sense according to the logic of you know, examining, I don't know, reaction mechanisms, post-viral entry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but a number of people at the time pointed out that actually, you know, most people capable of doing that work would also be capable, and, and the serious people were doing it at least in vitro work. Yeah. So if you do that, and then you have an in vitro study where you put the, you know, and you put the compound on various cells and you blah, 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 which, you know, and, and I think a lot of people understood that, that, that choice and saw the rationale behind it. But, you know, as John says, nobody likes having papers turned away. And, you know, it's, it's sort of every, every couple of weeks you see that, oh, my God, I got my first rejection from bioarchive thing. But, you know, I think you, you have to look at the big picture and understand why we have to make those decisions. I think most people are fair to you. You're, you're, you're ruling is very fair it's not you know as you said you're not taking because it's a name associated with it it's just a blanket rule so i think most people are actually quite accepting of that and, and it's worth bearing i mean this is a challenge for anyone i mean you know I, not i don't know how many people know that but it is worth remembering there is an entire preprint server called vixra which was built because people were so pissed off with being rejected from archive I mean, if you want to have some fun, go and look at some of the articles there, you know. I mean, I'm glad you made the point about fairness, Johnny, because the content team really take their task extremely seriously. And they explain, for the author's benefit, they explain the rationale behind the decision. Whether the author accepts it or not is another matter. But people are not being told no without an explanation. And that's something that's very important to the content. And I think they do a very good job in, in doing that. So I'm kind of surprised that nobody's thrown this accusation at you yet, uh, any of the conspiracy groups out there. But you set Med Archive up like months, just a few <laughs> months before a pandemic hit, yeah. almost like you saw it coming. No, actually, we engineered the, we, we, we did, the, we set up the server <laughs> first and then we engineered. So, you know, that was, on the one hand, incredibly fortunate because people had this almost dedicated place to put a lot of the COVID research because otherwise it would have been, I mean, a lot of it was meshed in still with BioArchive and a lot of the other preprint servers, but MedArchive really seemed to be the focal point, at least in the open access preprint side of things, for the COVID research. So, I mean, how did, how did that hit? That must have mean your lives must have been incredibly busy for, well, a few years now. Well, just to give a data point. So the first, the very first COVID-19 preprints appeared on BioArch, and I think the date was January 15th, 2020. In the subsequent 15 days, there were 30 papers, because we, you know, we collect, we've collected all the COVID-related papers. So I think there were 30 on BioArchive. In January of 2020, there were none on MedArchive. But in January of 2020, MedArchive got like, you know, posted 200 manuscripts because it was only six months old. In May of 2020, five months later, it posted 2,000. So that's a measure of the, you know, extraordinary deluge of, of information, first of all, that came out. And that's a credit to the research community around the world. But it was also an amazing tribute to the capacity of our content to rise to the occasion, which was immense. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've said this to a few people. I think this was the really the strange thing. I mean, it was, again, it was right place, right time and providing, and it was, it was one of those, you know, I'm never fond of the kind of whole build it and they will come. But this was, this was, you know, there was for this because, you know, we certainly never told anyone in China about or advertised about MedArchive and suddenly we were getting waves and waves of submissions and it was it was kind of i mean i i remember it very vividly because as john says we have this amazing content team but that team was pretty light when it when it started and so you know we had this very bizarre scenario in around april may where you know i mean i was i, I remember it's kind of like zooming with friends in the uk for example and there's lots of people sitting around they couldn't work. There were people in lockdown, that type of thing, not doing anything, saying, what do you, well, how's your life? And I said, well, basically everybody around me is working harder than they've mm. ever worked in their lives. We're all basically getting up, getting on our computer, spending 14 hours in front of our computers and then going to bed seven days a week. And, you know, and then we'd have these calls with uh, our colleagues at BMJ and Yale. 
and you know we'd have be trying to kind of you know as people say build the plane as you, as as you, as you're flying it so i think everybody was but you know i mean in, in, in i remember theo bloom um our colleague saying we, you know the good thing was that that we were really able to feel that we were doing something and and contributing in some way and i've always felt that this was particularly poignant for us being in new york because of course at that point in new york we were the real world epicenter of the pandemic and it was you know i live in i live in new york city and you know you could hear helicopters it was a very odd place to be it was totally silent you knew that there was like a thousand people dying every day so it was you know it was kind of an odd odd place to be but in in many respects uh, we could feel that we were we were contributing in some way and and then we got this really bizarre thing where we started you know i, I think john you have a slide of this too where you look at the submissions and there's this wave from china and this wave from italy and this wave from the united states you know which kind of was eerily eerily resembled the you know the the the, the case counts you know across the world so it was it was it was kind of it was kind of strange and then fortunately we were able to thanks to CZI we were able to scale up get more people on board and and as john says expand this really amazing team of people here at Cold Spring Harbor who've been working on this for, for two years and, and and doing an amazing job i mean to to go back to your original question johnny there was actually an editorial in the new york times written by eric topol and harlan krumholtz in I think 20 20- 15, basically saying there is this thing that biologists have called bioarchive. Medicine needs this too for a variety of, you know, rather specific reasons, only some of which was to do with accelerating the pace of medical research. One of the things that Harlan in particular is very concerned about is the frequency with which the data from clinical trials do not reach any kind of broad audience, you know, that that journals tend to publish the the positive, the the results of positive clinical trials, and there was not a mechanism for sharing inconclusive data from clinical trials. And Harlan felt very strongly that a preprint server could perform that function among among others. So, I mean, we, we had briefly considered expanding what we were building in 2013 into medicine. But, you know, I had enough from my three formative years at The Lancet. I knew enough about how medical communication worked to be very wary of doing that. And I, that was, in retrospect, that was such a good decision. So we thought we would do an experiment. So we introduced into BioArchive two categories of subject, one being clinical trials and one being epidemiology, to see if there would be an interest in, in these areas from that from those communities. Epidemiology took off. There were hundreds of manuscripts. Clinical trials, not at all. (laughs) But nevertheless, it was sufficient to be another piece of evidence in favor of doing a medically oriented preprint survey. And, you know, we were so fortunate to have the benefit of collaboration with Harlan Krumholtz and Joe Ross at Yale and Theo Bloom and Claire Rawlinson at BMJ, because they brought very particular kinds of expertise from the medical publishing world, from clinical medicine itself. And that partnership, I think, has been absolutely essential to whatever MedArchive has accomplished so far. And we have weekly, you know, we have weekly meetings about real, you know, about individual manuscripts in which there are different perspectives. And and that's been hugely valuable. Because I mean, I think that was the one that was the one thing that was very and what was part of our reason for our sort of initially treading very carefully and just dipping our toes in the water with the with those trials and, and epidemiology sections was understanding that it was different in medicine. There were different concerns and really underscoring to people that the screening at MedArchive is more severe. Um, it's again, it's not peer review, but you know, I mean, we, the first thing we did when we introduced those clinical trials categories in in bioarchives said that you've got to have a registered clinical trial ID, and that was the sort of first step. And then when we sat down and conceived MedArchive with the folks at BMJ and Yale, there was all these other things that we collectively decided were necessary. You know, you had to have um, a, a statement about IRB approval and, and, these, and, and lots of papers are returned saying if you haven't got you need to do this if you if it's not public data etc and again that I think that served us well come COVID-19 because suddenly you, got, you know I mean you had 
all sorts of treatment claims, etc. And it was it was really important that you had inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the and the numbers of papers rejected from from Med Archive are significantly higher. And you know, this this kind of better after peer review, this whole notion of things that might potentially be a danger to the public because of causing a, ch- a change in in behavior. So people always, you know, they talk about the MMR Lancet paper years ago. And we always say, you know, that wouldn't have gone on Med Archive because we wouldn't have made any judgment about the quality of the paper. We would just say something like this needs to go through peer review because the consequence of being wrong. And of course, the consequence of being wrong there were incredibly severe. So we didn't want to do that. So it's, you know, I mean, and, and again, you know, it's back to, we've had papers that we know are very, very good submitted to med archives and we say we get, we have to decline it because you know the consequences of being wrong are, are too risky needs to be better better through peer review and authors are, you know can be quite upset about it and it's like well you know that th- this is why it's not a judgment on the quality of your work and that i mean that feeds really nicely into what i was about to move on to but before i do i think it's worth pointing out that throughout the whole pandemic amazingly and incredibly the whole team have somehow managed to still get preprints screened in like two to three days, which you were doing before the pandemic. So that is just an incredible effort. Well, I'm glad you noticed that, Johnny, because that really is a tribute to how hard our colleagues work in this respect. They are amazing. So one of the big, well, one of the big arguments I seem to get into a lot over Twitter relates to people thinking that preprints are somehow poorer quality or not as good as peer-reviewed literature. Um, And this, I mean, this feeds into the misinformation angle. Obviously, this has become a lot more prevalent during COVID, because suddenly everybody, doesn't matter who you are, wants to read scientific papers. So, I mean, you kind of already touched on this, but obviously your screening processes in some ways do work better than peer review because you're not judging the work. You've just got fairly standardized rules. I mean, I see Richard on Twitter a lot arguing against these people as well. But, you know, what what is it you would say to people who have those thoughts that, you know, preprints are dangerous in some way? Um, I, well, I mean, the, the facetious answer is, have you read the peer-reviewed lecture yet? I mean, because that really is the case. I mean, I, I wrote an article for current medical research and opinion about this, pointing out, you know, I mean, the, as, as I often say, the papers that say that you get COVID from 5G towers, snakes, and outer space, none of those were preprints. Um, mm. You know, but, you know, there's a lot of, exa- you know, I mean, somebody sort of said, oh, you know, the danger of, you know, I mean, ivermectin has been a real challenge for everybody, and I don't have any sort of solution to what we do about that given that it seems to be that most of the papers have, you know, are fraudulent. But, you know, if you do a, do a PubMed search on COVID-19 and you'll find a number of ivermectin studies there. So, I mean, I think one of the things that it does is it just it, it emphasizes that, you know, a, a study, you can't take study in isolation. You need to look at the, um, the aggregate of all the evidence, which anybody who in, is in science know do anyway, and really understand how research Presses, understand that there'll be fits and starts. I mean, I, I just, the thing that sort of gets me slightly annoyed from time to time is I think a lot of this is very, very hypothetical. That's not to minimize it, but I really find it very hard to see some incredible danger or, so, or something incredibly dangerous that has happened. Now, I may do, and that's not to say it won't ever happen, but you know, I mean, if you look at, you look at the Surgisphere papers, you know, you look at some of the, the stuff that's come out in the peer reviewed literature. I'm, I find it very hard to see that, you know, a bunch of other papers that are coming out, which have a big sign on saying this might all be wrong, it's a preprint, are actually contributing significantly to that misinformation. I mean, it's it, interesting. Yesterday, I saw on, on Twitter yesterday, somebody was asking Elizabeth Bick about was she finding fraudulent research in preprints? And she said no. And that always struck me as that that makes sense to me is that the people who are who are faking all their gels, et cetera, they don't want eyes on them. Mm. You know, they want the credit for publication. Why would they? Pre- so I think, you know, I think what it I think what the, the real lesson is that, you know, the no what is what is peer review in science and clinical medicine is something that is far broader than this thing that we've been doing for 30 years, 35 years in journal publication. And and we really need to think about the opportunities that preprints afford to make that better, to educate people about science and educate people about the process of evaluating and ideally verifying science. Um, And so some things come with a caveat emptor sticker on them and some things that come with a sticker saying, this is great, might have garbage inside. 
Yeah, I don't think I've got much to add to that, Johnny. I mean, the, the critics, the people who, who cast aspersions, very often people from within the publishing community. Mm, yeah. And what they're doing is essentially they have an agenda that promotes the existing structures of scholarly publishing. And they fear that treatments are doing away with quality control and, and barriers that they think are very important. And I think what I, I always say that preprints are not about publishing. Preprints are about science. They're about knowledge and information sharing and so on. And the whole publishing thing is a different discussion and it's very much bound up with career advancement and academic recognition and so on and so forth. And I think what we should be focusing on with preprints is what they really are what rather than what they aren't, <laughs> you know. Yeah. There's too much cherry-picked discussion going on around them at the moment. So uh, I, try, I try not to get involved in those kinds of arguments because I don't, I don't think anybody's going to win. You know? No, I mean, that, that was my big argument recently on Twitter was publisher started it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one, just one thing to add to what John's saying now. I think the other thing is, there is in, from some quarters, there is a certain amount of disingenuity and, or, 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 kind of, or, or naivety to be more ch- charitable. One of the things that I have heard said is that, you know, Medical Journal X protects the public through its peer review process. And I think that's a failure to understand the difference between the isolated action that it takes and, and the systemic level. Mm. You know, if I sent a paper into new, um, that, that is garbage to New England Journal of Medicine and they reject it because they think it's bad, they protected New England Journal of Medicine from, from that paper. But, you know, that paper will then go to another journal. And the question is, is how much of the, you know, I mean, I was talking to a physician that I know about this and, and you know, he said early on that, uh, you know, he thought med archive was a terrible idea. Uh, and then he came back to me a couple of couple of weeks later and said, oh, I've thought more about it. I've decided it doesn't matter. All the crap get published anywhere, I guess it's published mm. somewhere. And so there's a little, little bit of, bit of that. And of course that gets back to the point that we were making earlier is, is understanding you know what what peer review is and trying to make it better and see it as a an ongoing process and and as and John pointed out and decouple it from you know this evaluation you know there's all these things there's evaluation dissemination verification they're all slightly different things and and hopefully you know in post preprint world we can we can do a better job of those things i mean the other benefit of course not only do you post preprints quickly but the retraction is also a lot quicker with a preprint server compared to the journals, which we've seen again during COVID was a bit of a feature. I mean, we we should make the distinction, Johnny, that we don't actually use the term retraction, at least in our servers. Um, withdrawal, though, is a, a mechanism and that can be activated by a variety of, for a variety of reasons, including the author's own volition. And we've seen this happen, you know, numerous times, particularly in uh, not that COVID-19 preprints have been withdrawn at a greater rate than others. That's not the case. But the reasons why may differ. So, you know, a a group may may make conclusions based on a data set of a certain size, but then time goes on, they have a bigger patient community or whatever, and they reanalyze and find that their initial conclusions don't hold up. So then they say, well, rather than update the preprint, we would like to withdraw it completely. And of course, we, we allow that to happen because these servers are author services and we help authors do what they do. So one of the things we've seen a lot in recent years is a mini explosion in all the different preprint servers that now exist. Uh, within the biosciences what are your thoughts on that because now we've got things that are very general we've got things that are country specific that are sort of topic specific are we ending up in a situation where eventually it's going to be a bit like the publishers are where we've got one thing for everything and you're suddenly judged on which preprint server you post your paper to not which journal you publish in uh that's an interesting question i i think we've always felt that what the community wants are fewer places rather than more but at the same time, I can see a rationale, for example, for a, a language-based server, and there are several of those, where the, the, the local research community want to publish in, in their own language. And we do not have the uh, capacity for posting uh, manuscripts in languages other than English because we don't have the ability to screen in languages other than English. Now, you know, in... 50 years time, that may be different, or even shorter time, that may be different. But for now, that's 
how we operate. So there are opportunities perhaps for other kinds of service to spring up. But on the whole, we feel that the community is saying to us, we want as much biological science in bioarchive as we can get. And that certainly would accord with our aspirations too. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I think the thing that's, that, that has been very clear from talking to people in the research community, and actually, you know, and I think many people in the publishing community viewed from an objective standpoint is that, you know, having thousands of preprint servers does not help anyone. They, people do not want that. I mean, it arguably makes sense for journals where they all have different types of kind of, you know, criteria for things. But we've always thought that largely discipline specific based repositories and, and, and repositories, frankly, that come from within the academic community and aren't controlled by commercial interests. Because, you know, I mean, let's be honest about it. The commercial interests have done a very good job of dominating the entire peer review space, you know, so it perhaps wouldn't be so bad if the academic community can, you know, sort of have a, a bigger hold on the preprint space with archive and bioarchive, social archive and, and various other people in other servers that we they talk with. But I, I mean, an, another thing, I mean, when we think also when we think of the experience of bioarchive and particularly med archive about the effort that has gone into thinking about inclusion criteria and screening criteria and how to do this responsibly. And I can't help but think that works better centralized the way we do it. I think if you set up your, a, a local clinical preprint server, I kind of think it's asking for trouble. And we didn't, you know, all those th- all the questions you've asked become more problematic in, in, in that scenario. I think where there is a lot of spaces, you know, I mean, we pointed out that, you know, we, we don't take protocols right? You know, because we don't think that it's a different thing. We don't take review articles. We don't, you know, I think there's a difference between comment and content about content is what we call it in our business as opposed to. So there's an awful lot of opportunity for that type of thing. You know, I mean, I think it's, you know, if we say we don't, we don't take review articles because it's problematic because of noise signal, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you know, if somebody wants to set up a little server that does do kind of reviews and commentary and opinion and blah, 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 then they can make decisions about what they want to put in it. And their decisions may be, you know, we'll only take papers from certain people or, or whatever. I mean, we could not apply that to hundreds of papers every day. We could, you know, it is problematic for us to say to, you know, we'll take a review article from this person at the bro, but we won't take them from this person in the global south that we've never heard of. We, you know, that's just, we want to be equitable about that. Um, and so that we have these scale problems, but you could have, you can imagine all manner of kind of smaller little servers that do things that are are not about the kind of like bulk research content that we do. So I think there's opportunities there, but for what we do, I think, I personally think bioarchive, med archive, archive, social archive, those, mm. those are the ideal for the research community. And it's important to emphasize that they are all independent, not for profit entities, you know, that the the rationale for their existence is different than the rationale for something that's essentially an extension of a a journal submission, for example. Mm. So what does the future hold for BioArchive, MedArchive, Cold Spring Harbor? Well, I mean, we firmly believe that we're on a good path. And we also firmly believe that we have a hell of a long way to go still. You know, the size of the primary literature, uh, it absolutely dwarfs um, the volume of preprints, regardless of which server they're on at the moment. So there's an awful lot of research outputs that are not shared uh, before journal publication with the community. So that's our aspiration is to continue to grow, to continue to add features and functions to both the servers that are useful for both authors and readers. And we are very fortunate to have the kind of support that allows us to be able to have those ideas and implement them technologically. And that's that's the goal, to continue to grow and continue to be even more useful to both categories of scientists. I, and I think that second point, I mean, I would, I would echo John's point about, you know, the, the boring answer to that question is just there's a lot more of the same to be done. There's lots of areas that, that are way behind genomics and developmental biology and cell biology that really, you know, I don't think physiology, for example, has got, has, it has you know, the, the, the notion has not penetrated into that community. So there's a lot more work to be done in a lot of those fields and, and really get to the point where, 
there's a lot of it just becomes a reflexive habit that you know you write your paper you put it on bioarchive and try and have that everybody do that for for every sort of sub discipline i think it's ultimately the goal um and then and then going back to this idea of of kind of you know peer review is a question we're frequently asked is well why doesn't bioarchive just offer a peer review service as well you know that would be so much easier and we what we've stuck to our initial kind of you know sort of mission to, to decouple these things so by so you know we can say absolutely bioarchive is not going to do that that is not not what bioarchive is about on the other hand we know that the existence of bioarchive can create space for other things to evolve and so i mean i think you're you're involved if i'm correct within pre-lights and things like that all of these yeah. things you know i think there's a really exciting prospect for a new communication ecosystem to evolve and we want to nurture that because if you have bioarchive you know if i would often say if i were launching a journal tomorrow and all the papers were going to be on bioarchive why would i build a hosting platform um, and so it's thinking about what what can we do and um, we do this with journals with the b2j j2b pathways where we make things easier for authors and for journals um, you know we that that has also been extended to things like review commons you know, what are these other things that we can help, we can help the community ex experiment by providing a kind of like, you know, we often, I think John and I both have a slide which says bioarchive is a utility. And then there's all these other things that can flourish around it, knowing that they don't have to worry about the water system, so to speak, so they can build something more interesting. And we will, we will help them, we will try and build the correct adapters from us to them. Um, and actually, and they can be reassured that we're not going to actually change their mind and say, you know what, we're, we're now going to do the thing that you're doing. And so, you know, I mean, uh, you probably saw the new dashboard that we have that, that links to all these other things. And the, and the critical thing about those, all those things is that, you know, that's not bioarchive. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a peer review from eLife or, or Embo. That peer review is sitting on, in, in hypothesis, not part of bioarchive. It was put in by somebody from eLife, not part of bioarchive. But the point is, when you're on bioarchive, you can see it. And you can see who did it. And, you know, we have the various other things and we, we'd like to expand that further. We, I mean, the most recent example being the conference uh, videos, where, where if, if the talk is recorded related, then the conference can put it in. And that it comes back to kind of that trust thing is, is that it's not just any video that goes up there. It's the video where you know that this was recorded. It is related to the preprint. The author has assented. And it's under the auspices of this group who are essentially verifying mm. that it is relevant, has been moderated, etc. And bioarchive is not doing that. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, the two things that, well, and the podcast, that make me keep coming back to bioarchive as basically the only preprint that I really use, if I'm being honest. Sorry to the rest of them out there. Is that, that that sort of community is just great. I'm involved with some of that anyway, but it really helps when you're looking at an article and trying to decide if it's good or not, if you can trust it or not. I don't have to rely on anyone from BioArchive to tell me because it's all linked out on Twitter or there's reviews there and it's all in one place, which is the best thing. The other thing, and actually this was, so I was talking to a journalist from the BBC last year and this is something he said and I completely agree and it's actually the really, really boring thing. But the way you do your categories on the side is so simple and straightforward. And he said that was his favourite thing about BioArchive just because he can get into exactly what he wants really really quickly and simply and actually when i thought about it that's the same thing i do so when like when we're looking for people to invite here i just click through the different categories and look at the first sort of three pages mm. and see what jumps out uh you know some of those are more, more interesting than the others but yeah that, that that's how i do it and it's such a simple thing but it's something that i mean a lot of journals don't get that right a lot of the other preprint servers don't get that right it's a lot more complex so yeah a corollary to your question about the future of the servers uh johnny is a question we often get asked you know are preprint servers going to replace journal and that was never part of the intent that's never been part of the vision and as um, we've shown i think in this conversation integration is important to both of these servers integration in a whole variety of ways and with a whole variety of other entities in the scholarly publishing ecosystem. Now, what is happening already is that even after, after only eight or nine years, journals are adapting, journals in biomedicine are adapting to the existence of preprint servers. And that, I think, is exactly, you know, what we've had in mind going, going forward. And I think that process will continue. So 
The intent is not to substitute for journals. The intent is to certainly change the publishing ecosystem, but enable journals to do perhaps better what they were always intended to do, going back to Oldenburg's principles from the um, 19th century. And uh, I think there are signs with initiatives at eLife and things like Review Commons and so on, that those changes are, are beginning. And I think there will be more. We're already talking to other entities that are you know, interested in building upon what, what these servers uh, represent. I mean, the eLife example is interesting to me in some ways because, you know, I mean, eLife have now moved to a point where they are mandating that you post a preprint on BioArchive or MedArchive. So, I mean, that to me is, it's incredible. You know, I mean, they're, they're not stupid. They wouldn't have done that if they thought that suddenly the submissions would dry up. So they, you know, it's pr that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing that we've got to a point where a very high profile journal that is widely supported among the scientific community and has obviously straight, strong support from HHMI and the other funders. Um, it, you know, the fact that a journal can do that, I think really shows how much the ecosystem has changed and can change because, you know, then, I mean, there's not many people who are biomedical scientists who would say that they were fundamentally different from the type of person who's submitting to eLife, hmm. I mean, you know. Yeah, we're hoping to get somebody from eLife on soon, actually, so we can have this conversation from that side soon, which will be good. I'm going to stop here because I really do need to go back to the lab to sort mice out. People should never work with mice. They rule your life. Um, but this, I could have kept this going on for hours because this was really, really great. Thank you so much for giving me your time. Thanks for the opportunity, Johnny. Thanks for having us. Take care. Thank you. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoy listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. Where do I find out about the different bioarchive licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. OK, OK, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. Mm -hmm.